Hey Sailor fam, welcome to church. We're so glad that you're here. Thank you for joining us to do church together on Sunday morning. If you're watching this at 11.30 a.m. IST, then you know the drill. We would love to see you in that live chat box. The live chat gives us a space to have a little bit of virtual community. It's our little meeting room on Sunday morning where we get to chat, say hi to each other, and of course, talk about the message that we're hearing as well. If you're brand new, if you just came across us on YouTube or someone sent you a link, we are so honored that you would spend your Sunday morning with us. Please know that you can get plugged into this community from anywhere in the world right now. So you can leave us a message on the live chat, tell us where you're watching us from, or even through our website so that we can get in touch with you and know if this, if this Sunday service has blessed you in some way. Our vision at Sela is to know God deeply, to love people authentically, and to live purpose intentionally. And some of the ways that we do that is by continuing to gather together on Sunday mornings to do church, even through these difficult times, right here on YouTube. And also continue to meet during the week at Connect Groups virtually. So if you'd love to be plugged in, do reach out to us. We would so love to get to know you. Well, as we prepare our hearts to go into a time of worship, and as we prepare to close this incredible series on wisdom that we've been doing for the last five weeks, uh, I'd just like to read a couple of verses to you from uh, Proverbs chapter 14, and I'm reading these out of the Passion Translation. I'm reading verses 27 and 28, and it reads, Confidence and strength flood the hearts of the lovers of God who live in awe of Him and their devotion provides their children with a place of shelter and security. To worship God in wonder and awe opens up a fountain of life within you, empowering you to escape death's domain. You know what, I, uh, when I read this first, I think I read it from the message translation, which actually reads, uh, the fear of God builds up confidence. And I thought to myself, that's pretty counterintuitive because where have you ever heard of any kind of fear building up confidence? But that's exactly one of the things that we spoke about when we when we looked at this um, in the last couple of weeks. We talked about how wisdom can tend to be counterintuitive sometimes. So then how do you actually navigate wisdom if it's not straightforward? Uh, and one of the things that I've really learned over this series is that so much wisdom literature really speaks to the condition of our hearts and speaks to the posture of our hearts. Uh, and you know what it says here in verse 28, to worship God in wonder and awe opens up a fountain of life within you and empowers you. Uh, the other place that we've actually looked at that, the idea of a fountain of life is when we spoke about, when the author spoke about guarding your heart, he said, guard your heart for it is the wellspring of life. So, so much of navigating wisdom really has to do with the condition of our hearts and the posture of our hearts. Um, so it's not really about having the technique to make all of the right decisions as much as it is having the character to make those decisions, to align our hearts, uh, to, to get to that place where we have the right kind of character to make the right decisions. Uh, so I think one of the really good questions that we can ask ourselves as we close this up and as we actually get now into a place where we're preparing our hearts to hear from God today uh, is where are our hearts at? Where is our heart at? Uh, and where is Jesus in that right now? Because I believe that if we give him that right place in our hearts, uh, we everything else will set itself straight everything else all the decisions that we make will flow from that place and everything that we do will flow from the condition of our heart and that has completely to do with the place that we give god in our lives so as we prepare our hearts now for worship can we examine can we take this time to just look inwards examine our hearts and allow god to do what he wants to do in our lives today can see the promised land, though there's pain within the plan. There is victory in the end, your love is my 
my battle cry When my fears like Jericho Build their walls around my soul When my heart is overthrown Your love is my battle cry The anthem for all of my life Every giant will fall The mountains will move Every chain of the past You've broken into Over fear, over lies We're singing the truth That nothing is impossible With you With you The shadows steal the light Your love is my battle cry The anthem for all of my life Every giant will fall The mountains will move Every chain of the past Is broken into Over fear, over lies We're singing the truth That nothing is Impossible Every giant will fall The mountains will move Every chain of the past You've broken into Over fear, over lies We're singing the truth That nothing is Impossible with you Nothing is impossible No greater name no higher name, no stronger name than Jesus. You overcame, broke every chain, forever reign, King Jesus. No greater name, no higher name, no stronger name than Jesus. You overcame, broke every chain, forever reign. King Jesus Every giant will fall The mountains will move Every chain of the past You've broken into Over fear, over lies We sing in the truth That nothing is impossible Every giant will fall The mountains will move Every chain of the past Broken into over fear, over lies. We sing in the truth that nothing is impossible with you. Nothing is impossible. Bless you. 
shine upon you and be gracious to you. Lord, turn his face toward you and give you peace. Amen. 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 He's for you, he's for you, he's for you, 
before you. May his favor be upon you for a thousand generations and all of your family. He is for you. Do you believe that? Do you believe that? Today, let's just, this song was just a, a prayer straight from scripture, a blessing straight from scripture, and it speaks for itself. And we just are going to go before God this morning and we're going to just recognize him for who he is and for what he has done for us. Heavenly Father, we know that you are for us, God, that you are good, that you are our perfect Father, God, more perfect than any human earthly father could ever be, God. We know that we can rely on you, God, and that your blessing comes to us, God, because you are our Heavenly Father, God, and help us to know that you are with us, God, that you want the best for us, God. Help us to seek your face, God, and help us to understand that true wisdom and the fear of the Lord comes from you, God, through your wisdom and through your presence in our lives. Thank you, God, because you are so, so good to us, God, even when we don't deserve it. God, I pray for each and every person that's watching this, God, that you would bless them, that your favor would be upon them, God, that your face would shine upon them, God, and that they could experience the true peace that only you, the true living God, can offer. Lord, speak to us now as we go before your word in just a few minutes. In Jesus' name. If you're new here, here's some information for you. Our Sunday services happen right here on YouTube at 11.30 a.m. You can subscribe to our channel and hit the notification bell to know when we go live. Soon after the service, we get together on Zoom for a meet and greet and prayer. The link is in the video description box. Our junior church, ages 10 to 15, meets on Sundays at 2 p.m. on Zoom. Our kids' church, ages 3 to 9, also meet on Sundays at 2 p.m. on Zoom. Our connect groups meet virtually and you can join us from anywhere. Head to our website for more information on a group you can join. Instagram is a great place to engage with us during the week. Follow us at Sela Mumbai for some great content. Thank you for consistently giving your tithe and offering during this time. You can continue to give and also support the COVID Relief Fund via our website. Welcome back, fam. We hope you caught all those updates. As always, know that you can join a connect group from anywhere and we would love it if you got in touch with us either on the live chat or on our website to let us know if you'd like to get plugged in. We're about to get into week five, the final message of the series, Walking in Wisdom. Hasn't this been an incredible series? I have learned so much. I've literally felt the growth. And uh, we had Pastor Kirli Lowe bring us the word last week, all the way from C3 City Church uh, in Sydney. And this week, we're closing up with our very own Pastor Ryan Waters. Here he is bringing us the word all the way from Perth.
hey Sailor, how are you? I hope you're well, wherever you are, whatever you're doing right now. Put down everything and uh, let's spend some time with the Lord in God's Word. Uh, I hope you like our new surroundings. This is uh, the, uh, the studio of C3 Hepburn Heights. They are so uh, kindly uh, letting us use it so that the quality we are giving to you would be better. I hope you enjoy this. I certainly am. Uh, just on the other side of this camera, there's a, a great young man called Michael. Some of you might remember Michael. He came over to Mumbai uh, a few years ago and was one of the team that came over with uh, C3 Hepburn Heights. He is busy checking everything is okay behind the scenes here. Okay, we are on our last week of the series Walking in Wisdom and uh, I have had uh, a, a great time just being in the book of Proverbs, studying it, learning from it. Uh, I feel wiser as a result. I feel like there's more just knowledge that I've kind of learnt over these last five weeks than um, uh, a lot of times. And it's great because we are in such a season of uncertainty, aren't we? We're in such a season where there is a lot of decisions that we need to be making that we may not have foreseen that we would need to be making. And we need to be doing these things from a place of wisdom. So even for me and uh, or for Rachel and I, in this time, having wisdom, going through the book of Proverbs has been beneficial. Um, so first week of, just to give you a summary of the last five weeks, and you can, this is the beauty of having an online church, you can go and binge watch all five of them now once this one's uploaded. And uh, the first week we talked about how wisdom begins with a philolal fear. You remember what that word, you probably don't use that word philolal. Philolal fear is, a, is the fear of God that says, you are my father and I am your child. And you are, as my father are gonna teach me. It's a, it's a fear, not, not a, it's not a servile fear. So a servile fear is the kind of fear that's like, I'm a slave and you're my slave master and I better do what I'm told. Otherwise, you know, lightning is going to come and strike me out of the sky. That is not the kind of fear that God desires of us. The kind of fear that we have to have of God to understand how he works and understand how he teaches us is to understand that he is like a father who is teaching a child. When you have that perspective, you understand even the gospel. The gospel makes sense because the father sent his son to rescue us because he's our father that makes jesus our big brother isn't that cool so that was that one then week two we had pastor phil uh, which was a great interview that rachel and i had the privilege of sharing with him and uh, I, I loved one of the uh, things that he said he says wisdom begins when we accept that we don't have it wisdom begins when we accept that we don't have it and he said that sometimes God gives weird wisdom, just different wisdom. And it's a matter of trust and whether or not we will follow through and trust in the Lord and his wisdom. But when we do, there is benefits. And then uh, on week three, uh, I, I, I did a sermon called The Path Determines the Destiny. Um, and we always have a choice. It's, it's the choice of the daily little things that we do that actually make up for the larger things of life. It's the path that you're on, the choices that you're making right now, which will determine where you end up. We so often just look at life from the perspective of, I wanna be at this destination, but maybe we're not on that right path. Our choices are wrong. Our daily habits are wrong. That's why we pray every day. That's why we get in God's word and read it every day. That's why we commit to being at church like you're doing right now as a pathway as a pathway wisdom is a pathway it's not a it's not a magic word that opens up all of the opportunities it's not a magic sort of thing like i've got wisdom so therefore life is going to be amazing no i will it, it's more like i'm going to get wisdom as i keep my heart open to the lord allow him to teach me on this journey that god's got me on uh, then last week we had Pastor Kiralee who spoke a great sermon uh, about hum called Humility is the New 
black humility is the new black it was so great to have pastor Curly with us now this week we are the subtitle of today's sermon is this it's lady wisdom's feast lady wisdom's feast or madam folly's cup of water lady wisdom's feast or madam folly's cup of water it's kind of a long title but I thought it might draw you into the story that is going on in Proverbs chapter 9, which is the text we're going to be teaching out of today. Proverbs chapter 9. Can I start with reading Proverbs chapter 9, verses 1 through to 5, and then we'll go from there. Wisdom, this is verse 1 of chapter 9, wisdom has built her house. She has set up its seven pillars. She has prepared her meat and mixed her wine. She has also set her table. She has sent out her servants and she calls from the highest point of the city. Let all who are simple come to my house. To those who have no sense, she says, come eat my food and drink the wine that I have mixed. That's Lady Wisdom. She sent out her servants. They're out on the highest point of the city. And I love the picture that this creates of who Lady Wisdom is. You can see that she's generous. She's, she's prepared a meal. She's prepared a great big meal, a feast for her guests. And it's a feast that is not discriminating. It's for anyone. Anyone can come. So she could end up with any number of guests at her house. They're all welcome to come eat of the food that she's prepared. And that's the other thing. She's prepared. She's generous, she's prepared, she's ready. She's sent her servants out. She sent them out, so she's got servants. She's wealthy and also she's got a seven-pillared house. Now, there's been a lot of theological, theological conjecture about what those seven pillars represent. Nobody really knows. There's a lot of theories out there. Basically, most of the Bible doc, uh, you know, the Bible scholars will say it just means that she was wealthy because it was a large seven pillar home. So she's she's generous, she's ready and she's wealthy. That's Lady Wisdom. Then in Proverbs chapter nine, verse 13 and 15, we see this other character, Madam Folly. Let's talk about Madam Folly for a second. Madam Folly is in Proverbs chapter 9, verse 13. Let me just go to it. it. says this, Folly is an unruly woman. Sounds like a real catch. She's a simp- she is simple and knows nothing. She sits at the door of her house on a seat at the highest point in the city, calling out to those who pass by, who go straight on their way. So here's Lady or Madam Folly. She's simple. She doesn't know anything. She's simple. She knows nothing. Okay, that um, she knows nothing could also, when you look at the translation uh, from the original text into English, uh, it also could mean that she knows no shame. So she's one of these people that just doesn't She's got no filter whatsoever. She's going to say and do whatever she wants. She's got no filter. Okay. And she's lazy. Why why do we know she's lazy? Well, instead of going out and actually getting the attention of those passers-by, she's just sitting at her door, yelling out to them. If you can just imagine this lady just sitting at her door, yelling at anyone who passes by, to get their attention and invite them on into her house okay and it reminds me this this lady it reminds me of a time i was in driving through bandra in mumbai and one of the great things i've learned uh over the over the time of our our living in mumbai is that google maps is like a boon it is an amazing tool that I use probably more than any other tool because Mumbai is so complex in all its lanes and gullies and this and that that you can get very easy, easily lost. Now most of the time Google Maps worked and it was good but every now and again Google Maps would give you a really really bum 
sort of weird shortcut. And some of these shortcuts, particularly in places like Bandra, are like, as you would know, this like kind of take you down these village laneways. And in these village laneways, there's a, there's a particular stereotype of person that seems to find themselves down there in those laneways. And one of the people that I came across one day when Google Maps gave me a bit of a bum steer, I ended up, and you know, I've got this older Nova that we, that we have, and I'm down in this really, really, really narrow laneway in Bandra, and it's a market. And, and, but in, a, in the midst of all this market, there's this one guy who's got this house, and he's probably been passed down for generations since whenever, and he's sitting on his front porch, and, porch, and he's got a great big belly, He's got no t-shirt on and uh, he's just sitting on his porch watching life go by. And he pretty much, as I'm driving by, because you know the Innova window is kind of high, so he's, we're at the same level and he's this far from me. And as I'm driving past, he goes, you can't bring your car here. This, 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 this lane's too narrow. And I remember thinking, why are you sitting there just looking at life? like this and it just brought to mind when I read this this picture of of Madame Folly just she's just sitting there she's got nothing else to do except just wait for passers-by to make some sort of comment this is Madame Folly the same as that character and I'm sure maybe you who live in Mumbai you've probably I don't know you've probably seen this same fellow because that's that's the way things seem to happen down in in Mumbai (laughs) lady or Madame Folly she's this unruly woman She's, she's, she's got nothing. She doesn't know anything. But here we have these two ladies who are inviting these people. See, in verse 9, in chapter 9, verse 15 to 7, Madam Folly, she's inviting. Uh, it says, I'm, she's calling out to those who pass by, who go straight on their way. Let all who are simple come to my house. That's who she's calling out to. And she also says to those who have no sense. And then in 17, she says, stolen water is sweet. Food eaten in secret is delicious. So the invitation is to a person who is simple and who has no sense. And then what she's offering, her cup is, well, she's offering stolen water and she's offering food to be eaten in secret. But on the other hand, if we look at Lady Wisdom, in 9 verse 2, it says that she has prepared her meat and mixed her wine. She has also set her table. So this is what's on offer. There's a meal on offer here, okay, with wine. And we'll talk about that wine. And then in Proverbs chapter 9 verse 4 to 5, it says that she's the offer is going out, the invitation is going out to those, it says, let all who are simple come to my house. To those who have no sense, she says, come eat my food and drink the wine that I've mixed. So it's interesting. Both Lady Wisdom and Madam Folly are actually competing for the same market. They're both competing for the same people. It's the person who is simple and the person who has no sense. Now, people might say, well, I've, I'm not simple. I've got a lot of sense. Have you ever come across a person who's book smart, but has no street wisdom? Who doesn't, like they know, they can recite every book that they've learnt in school, but you put them out in normal life and they just don't seem to have the wisdom to converse with someone or make great financial choices or all sorts of things like that. In every aspect of our own lives, there is some place where we don't have sense, where we may be simple. And you, you might say, well, no, 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 Ryan, I'm, I'm, I'm a very sophisticated person. You might be sophisticated, but even for a sophisticated person, there is always something that we don't know. So there's this invitation that's going out, presented to that person who is simple, who has no sense. And this can be in any aspect of our life. 
This may be in a spiritual sense, it may be in a, in a physical sense, this may, be, this may be in a philosophical sense, this may be in one of these senses where there will be places where we come in life where we don't have the answer, where we'll be simple and we'll need sense. And what's presented at these moments will always be these two metaphoric women. Madam Folly or Lady Wisdom. Now, Madam Folly's offer as the answer for the simple is this. It's verses 15. I kind of read it. It's verses 17, really, where she says to them, stolen water is sweet. Food eaten in secret is delicious. What does this mean? Well, I'm going to read from you from uh, one of the commentaries that I use. It's called the Bible Knowledge Commentary. And it gives a good explanation that I thought would just be a good way to lead into what I, what I thought is the explanation on this. It's, it's this. Since drinking water from one's own fountain refers to sex in marriage. So that's based on five Chapter 5 of Proverbs, uh, verses 15 to 16. The stolen water may refer to illicit sex. Okay, so that's referenced. You can also reference in this chapter 7, verses 18 and 19 of Proverbs. In this way, now hear this. In this way, Madam Folly appealed to her guests baser desires. She's appealing to her guests' baser desires. And then it says, food eaten in secret also suggests a clandestine activity, right? But I wanted to focus in on this concept that, that she's, she's offering, she's offering and appealing to the guests' basest or baser uh, desires. What, are, what is a base of desire? The base of desire of any human being is if you see it, take it. If you want it, have it. If it feels good, then do it. Or another way that we could justify our baser desires is to say, well, if you want, just follow your heart. And we spoke about this a few weeks ago, didn't we, with, with the, this saying that was, that was coined that the heart wants what the heart wants, which was a saying that Woody Allen said to justify his divorce and remarriage. The heart wants what the heart wants. When we follow this path, it seems like a path that is right. When we follow this path, it seems like it can't harm us because we're just doing what we want to do. But what the book here, what chapter 9, where it's offering these two, these two choices here between these two invitations, is there's, there's a warning here. There's a beware because in verse 18 of chapter 9, when talking about this invitation and what is offered by Madam Folly, it says this, it says, but little do they know that the dead are there. It's talking about in her home. That her guests are deep in the realm of the dead. The problem, when we take the path of our feelings and what we just want, is we can end up in a place where our feelings have gotten to us or gotten us to a place where we've forgotten about consequence, where we've forgotten about the fact that for every motion, there's an opposite or equal reaction. There's, there's always something that is going to come about as, an, as a result of what we do. But she says, no, nah, forget it. Let's just not tell anyone. Let's just, let's just, 
I mean, let's, why don't we, my husband's away. Why don't we just, you know, have some fun? That's what she says. There's no consequence, but there is. So that's the invitation to Lady Folly's house. And then we have Lady Wisdom. Well, she gives meat and mixed wine. In verse 6, she says, Leave your simple ways and walk in the way of insight. Now, firstly, she's giving a nutritious meal. It's not just, it's not just whatever you want. It's a nutritious meal. It's mixed. Sorry, it's, it's meat and mixed wine. Now, it's interesting to note that it's mixed wine because this is probably talking about a kind of wine that was served back then that would sit on one shelf and it was it was a mix it had to be mixed because that wine would be really strong too strong in taste not not like the kind of the nicer wines of today that are kind of been craft crafted by these master winesmen it's not like that it's it's a very rough kind of alcohol based drink that is made from grapes but it isn't pleasant to drink so you have to mix it down in order to drink it with water. So she's giving this meat and this mixed wine. It's talking about nutrition and also something that is going to be a little bit more heavier for the soul to digest. It's not an easy meal. And then at the meal, she's, she's offering a correction. She's telling the guests, okay, you guys, Leave your simple ways. Don't go down the path of folly. Leave your simple ways and walk in the way of insight. This is a criticism. This is a, a correction. Now, what, what, what's a, what's, what is it to criticize a person? Well, to criticize a person is to find fault with, to find fault with or to express a criticism of or to point out a real or perceived flaw that a person may have. But who knows, the world today has become so cynical, has become so critical of anyone that wants to point out anything about anyone in order even to help them. It's become a strange place. Today, if you put the right labels on a person because you don't like what they have to say, you can actually get your own way. You can label a person, and this is going on in boardrooms, this is going on in universities, this is going on in schools where a teacher or a professor or a, uh, or a politician may say something that is correct. But someone can come and say, and they would have maybe have come from some sort of postmodern uh, deconstructionist kind of main fry, mindset where they, where they view that, that all, all of the, the social constructs around us are just constructed in order to control people. And you're just using what you know in order to control me. And they'll say, you are trying to control me. So therefore, you can't tell me that I'm wrong. And by you saying that I'm wrong, that means you're making me feel unsafe and I feel unsafe around you. So therefore, you're abusive. This is the world we live in. It's gone a little crazy. It's gone a little crazy where people can't even say what's right so much anymore. Isn't that weird? But the problem with that is that we are living or we are going to continue to live in a place where people are just fools because they cannot be told. In other parts of Proverbs, it says that wisdom is bound up in the heart of fools. And a part of what's going on, even in education right now, is, is, is that teachers around the world are actually being encouraged to not even tell parents about some of the activities of their kids because they might, they might actually have the parents not approve of what's going on with their children. So the kids are choosing what they want. But... Folly is bound up in the heart of a child. So we're going to have all of these children that may even do things that could harm them, that they may regret, but they did it before they were 25, before that prefrontal cortex was 
put together in their mind and the way God works and developing a mind that they may regret one day. And this is the world we live in. And I, I'm just astounded because I think we are on a pathway. Humanity is on a pathway where people are just going to be more and more foolish because nobody will be taught. But see, when you go to the house of Lady Wisdom, she's going to correct you. She is going to bring a different opinion. She's going to bring something that you may not even like. She's going to point something out about you that needs to change. And anyone who's had anything to do with Lady Wisdom will know that it ain't nice when you drink of that mixed wine. You drink it and you go, oh, that, boy, there's nothing nice about that. I don't want to drink that. But sometimes it's exactly what we need when you actually begin to think about this and you actually begin to think of the alternative. What's the alternative? The alternative is Lady or Madam Folly, where she just says, no, no, don't worry about it. Just do whatever you want. No, forget the consequence. It's all right. Live a little. Live and let die. Da -da -da. You know old song? Live and let die. <laughs> live and let die. Who cares? No, it should be more like, just live now, but you will die later for it, but that's okay. You know, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 4 to 12, and I'll end with this. It says this. Uh, yeah, verse 4 to 13, excuse me. It says this. It says, in your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. And have you completely forgotten this word of encouragement that addresses you as a father's a father addresses his son. It's his son. It says, "My son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline, and do not lose heart when the Lord rebukes you, because the Lord disciplines the one He loves, and He chastens everyone He accepts as His son. Endure hardship as discipline. God is treating you as His children." For what children are not disciplined by their father? If you are not disciplined and everyone undergoes discipline, then you are not legitimate, not true sons or daughters at all. Moreover, we have all had human fathers who disciplined us and we respected them for it. How much more should we submit to the Father God of spirits and live? They disciplined us for a little while, as they thought best. But God disciplines us for our good, in order that we may share in His holiness. No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. Therefore, strengthen your feeble arms. And weak knees, get ready, he's saying. Make level paths for your feet so that the lame may not be disabled, but rather healed. In other words, get ready for God to discipline you as you accept this invitation. You see, the invitation that comes from God is an invitation of salvation. It is, a, it is an invitation of rescue where He will rescue, rescue you from the consequences of sin. And it changes your eternal destiny forever, for good. It was all finished on the cross on behalf of you and I because of the love of the Father. But it doesn't end there. See, God calls us into redempt redemption. And redemption is a process of discipleship. And the sad thing is, is a lot of people, they come to know Jesus. They love the rescue part. They love the prayers that make them feel good. And there are a lot of prayers that make you feel good. When we begin to pray for one another, man, the Holy Spirit comes. He, he comes like a dove and he just, I felt that just the elation of, of God's presence. And I love it. I'm addicted to it. When I put on some worship music, sometimes I just, 
oh man, I just float off into another place and I forget all of my troubles. I just love all of that and that's necessary, but it doesn't stop there. See, God also brings a hand of discipline. And it's the hand of discipline. It's the hand of training. It's the process of God working in us and changing us and transforming us. That's where Lady Wisdom sits. This is the house of Lady Wisdom, where this strong food, it's not, it's not just any old food, it's strong food, it's, it's meat, it's, it's tough sometimes, it's hard to digest. As I've gotten older, I have to be careful not to eat too much meat in one meal because it kind of makes me feel like I've got reflux, getting old. Because meat is harder for the body to digest and the strong wine that is offered is sometimes not that tasty, it's not that fun, it's not that great, it's not that pleasurable. But God is trying to produce something in us as we take the path of wisdom. And there will be moments, forks in the road, where we will have an invitation to either continue on that path or hear the call of Madame Folly sitting on her porch. She can see you go by and she can see that you are walking in a territory and through a place and in a trial and in a season that you ain't never been in before. And she's saying, come, come, Let's forget it. Give yourself a break. Why don't you take off the edge? Here, try this cup of water. It's stolen, makes it more fun. But you'll forget all of your troubles. And little do we know in these moments that those choices are the choices that we make where we step off the path of wisdom and onto the path of folly, which leads us to destruction. And it's as simple as that. The choice that we lay, we have lying before us right now is, is as it always has been. And it is to follow that path of righteousness. And how do we do that? We remember the gospel. We remember the fact that we need God. We need to remember the cross. If you've stepped off the path of righteousness, if you've stepped off the path of wisdom, and you've in some way, shape or form, whether it be in your work life, in your family life, in your financial life, and even in your leisure, even what you do to relax sometimes, you allow yourself to just go and stay over the night at Madame Folly's house. Remember, it's a path. It's not just a place you go and hang out. It's a path with a destination. If the Holy Spirit is just working in your heart right now and bringing conviction to one of these areas of your life, why don't, why don't you just bring that before the cross and repent of whatever that sin is? Bring it before God. He accepts you because of the cross. Relinquish that sin. Flee from it. It's not going to do, it's not going to do you anything but bad. And run to the Father who wants to teach you, who wants to train you, who wants to help you to be an overcomer. Not just a person who does what they want, but an overcomer. One who is victorious in life. That's the pathway that God has for you. And it's a pathway that has all been made possible because of the cross. And Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth and the life. He meant that he is the way, the truth and the life. And he will heal you of your wounds, but he'll also teach you how to be a warrior, and how to be his child, how to be a person who is victorious in whatever trial, whatever tribulation we're in. As we walk this path of wisdom, we come out on the other side of these things better for it because God is with us. Amen. So it's been an amazing series, Walking in Wisdom. I kind of want to keep it going, but it's nearly Christmas, guys. 
It's time to start a new series next week where we will be starting on the pathway to Christmas. A few weeks where we'll just talk about the need for Jesus and why Jesus came. As we look at that, we'll bring this series to a close. So let me pray for you. Dear God, I thank you for everyone here. We thank you for this series. Lord, I pray that this series, Lord God, in some way will um, spark further a further desire to study the book of Proverbs and really apply it into our lives and help us to find where the gospel is in all of these concepts in Jesus name. Lord, I pray for every person wherever they're at right now, whatever they're going through. Lord, I pray in Jesus name that they would walk the path of wisdom and eat at Lady Wisdom's house and be aware to stay away from Madam Folly's invitation in Jesus name. Amen. Bless you guys. We'll see you soon. Good morning, church. It's my privilege to share with you the communion message this morning. And when I was doing that, my, I was praying and reading my Bible to see what I can share with you. There's, there was one thought that came to my mind that was Jesus' resurrection. You know, when we partake that communion, many times we fall in one problem, that we only remember that Jesus died. But that's half of the gospel. The gospel is that Jesus died, that he was buried, and that he rose again. And the resurrection changed everything. You know, historians can prove that Jesus was a human, that Jesus lived in the earth, even they can prove that Jesus died in the cross. But the world today wants to eliminate the fact of the resurrection. Why? Because if Jesus rose again, what he said was true. And if what he said is true, that means that the only way for us to go to him is through faith in Jesus. So the resurrection changes everything. You know, when we think about the resurrection and the gospel, for instance, we, think, we say that the gospel is good news. We say that. But without the resurrection, our news are not good. So the resurrection made the news to be good. Without the resurrection, we don't have salvation. We don't have hope. So let's think together for a few minutes, what would have happened if Jesus would never rose again from the dead? So if we go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Paul will answer that question. So we are in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and let's read verse 14. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain, and your faith is in vain. Verse 15, we are even found to be misrepresenting God, because we testify about God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise. If it is true that the dead are not raised. Verse 16. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. So the resurrection is extremely important for our life. So if Jesus didn't raise from the dead, you are losing your time and I'm losing my time. Pastor Ryan and, and Rachel are doing a job that is in vain. Why? We should close Sela and don't open the doors of the church anymore if Jesus didn't rose again. So that's why the resurrection is so important for us. So if we think why the resurrection is important for us, first of all, this passage teaches us that this, if, if Jesus didn't rose again, the disciples were a bunch of liars. They were liars. If Christ did not rise again from the dead, these 12 disciples were the, the men that believed the biggest lie in history. Not only they believe it, but they also share the biggest lie with everyone. And the passage says that they were misrepresenting God. Many times when we lie, you know, to be honest, we, we all of us lie, sadly, because we are sinners. But we lie, why? Because we want to escape a problem. But this lie that the disciples believe got them into trouble, you know. So the disciples were, if they believe this lie, they were people to be pitied. So the disciples were liars. What else? Our faith is in vain, Paul, Paul tells us here. What would it be worth a Messiah that is still there? 
What, why a person promised me to give me eternal life and he, is, he never defeated death? He promised me a hope without a foundation. He promised me eternal life, but he's still in, in the grave. My faith is no greater than the object of my faith. So if we have a dead Messiah, we don't have a Messiah. So that's why it's important for our faith, for our faith that Jesus rose again. Also, sin and death are in power, are in power over us. And that's in verse 17. And it says, and if Christ has not been raised, your faith is in vain and you are still in your sins. Can you imagine? Can you imagine going in your life without the feeling of being forgiven? That Jesus forgave all your sins? The resurrection helped us to put our weights and everything upon Jesus. But if Jesus didn't rose from the dead, we are still carrying our sins. And his sacrifice was never enough. So without a resurrection, we don't have a savior. If we don't have a savior, we don't have forgiveness. And the last thing that this passage tells us in verse 19 is, it says, If in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people most to, to be pitied. So our future is very scary because we don't know what's going to happen in the next life. But Jesus rose, he died, and he rose again. So that's why we have hope. If Jesus did not rose from the dead, what hope do we have? We don't have any hope. Our faith is in vain. Sin and death are still in power. And our future is very, very scary. So if Christ is in the tomb, there is nothing that can give us hope. But if Christ is not in the tomb, there is nothing that can take our hope away from him. Do you realize how important the resurrection is? We won't have anything. We will not have hope, joy, peace without the resurrection. So if we live our life only looking at the crucified Christ, we will live our life in self-pity. But if we look our if we live our life looking at the death of Jesus but his resurrection, we will live a victorious life, understanding that we defeated sin because of what he has done in the cross. So that's what I want you to remember. That when we celebrate and we partake these symbols, we are a people that have a victory. And that victory only comes through Christ. So when we partake this bread, let's remember that he died, but he rose again from the dead. Let's partake together. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this bread that represents your body that was crucified in the cross and that was crushed for our sins. But thank you that three days later you rose again and the resurrection proved that your sacrifice was enough. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And also we partake this cup that represents Jesus' blood. Let's remember that this blood is the only one, the only thing that can give you forgiveness of all your sins. Let's partake. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this time that we have together. Thank you for these symbols that represents Jesus' body and his blood. Thank you that, that Jesus died that he was buried, but also thank you that he rose again, that he sealed our salvation, he sealed our hope and our peace and our joy, and that we can have that eternal hope for what you have done for us in the cross. Thank you that these symbols do not mean something sad for us, but it means victory, and that we can live in the victory that only Christ can give us. In Jesus' powerful name we pray. Amen. Thank you very much and God bless you. 
Hey Church, well that was our service. Thank you so much for staying all the way through to the end. We're so glad for your time, even in the live chat. It was so good to hang out with you. Well, I'd like to encourage you to come back next week as we kick off our four-week Christmas series. And we're going to start with hearing from Pastor Akshay Rajkumar all the way from Delhi. We are so thrilled about the series and we can't wait to share more with you. So please block your calendars. We'll see you right back here on YouTube, 11.30 a.m. on Sunday as always. Until then, have an incredible week.